Hello friends, my name is JJ. So the other day over in Alberta, there were two big back-to-back -back gatherings of the Western Canadian right-wing elite. The two events, one in Calgary, one in Edmonton, were hosted by Alberta's Conservative Party Premier, Danielle Smith, and featured a sold-out audience of thousands of Conservative VIPs, including politicians, candidates, activists, and journalists. Now, all of these people didn't trudge out into the snowy Alberta night just to see Premier Smith, although she is quite popular in Canadian conservative world these days, nor were they there to see the other headliner, Conrad Black, the Canadian-born business mogul slash political columnist. They weren't even there to see the third headliner, Jordan Peterson, easily the most famous Canadian conservative on earth right now. No, the big draw was Tucker Carlson. You know, the recently fired Fox News host who is enjoying a newfound career broadcasting exclusively online on the Tucker Carlson network. As a Western Canadian with a lot of friends on the right, I have to say that the Significance of this event cannot be understated. People were scrambling to get tickets, not just because they wanted to see Tucker, although that was obviously a huge draw, but because they knew that Tucker was such a rock star to Canadians on the right, they'd be missing a huge opportunity to network with other conservative big shots if they skipped it. And the attendance numbers certainly seem to suggest they were correct. I thought this was all very interesting because it gives me an opportunity to respond to a question that I am asked a lot about conservatives in Canada. Namely, are they any different from conservatives in the US. The popularity of the Tucker event provides an answer, but it is also a more complicated one than you might think. So the two Tucker events were hosted, as I said, by the Conservative Premier of Alberta, and this provided an opportunity for progressives all across Canada to fearmonger about the closeness of Canadian Conservatives with the Conservative movement of the United States, led by deeply controversial men like Carlson and Donald Trump. So I call today on Premier Smith to reflect deeply on the consequences of her choices. I urge her to apologize for exploiting the office of the Premier in order to elevate the platform of someone like Tucker Carlson. Now, one prominent Canadian Conservative VIP who was not in attendance at either event was the head of the Conservative Party of Canada, Pierre Polyev. Accordingly, officials in Prime Minister Trudeau's inner circle wasted little time in demanding Pierre condemn Tucker and Premier Smith in order to make his allegiances clear. And they obviously made that demand, not because they actually care what Pierre thinks, but because they believe they have discovered what the political science people call a wedge issue. A wedge issue is, of course, when you force a politician to take a position that you know will piss off as many voters as it will attract. Trudeau's liberal administration believes that American conservatism is one such wedge. On the one side, it is clear that a significant chunk of the base of the Conservative Party loves men like Tucker and Trump and presumably most of the other leading lights of the MAGA movement. But on the other side, a lot of these Trumpy people are broadly unpopular with Canadians in general and suburban swing voters in particular. Accordingly, Trudeau has started using terms like MAGA conservatives to tar his rivals, and it's been reported that the Prime Minister's team believes that drawing lines between Pierre Polyev and Trump should play a large role in his campaign for a fourth term in 2025. Now, I don't think that this is a bad strategy for Trudeau, and I don't even think it is particularly disingenuous. Associating the Republicans with the Canadian Conservatives can obviously be done in a demagogic or chauvinistic way, and that is doubtless what Trudeau will do. But just as a matter of objective fact, Canada's Conservatives can no more fully divorce themselves from the Republicans than Trudeau's Liberals can divorce themselves from the Democrats. The spiritual links between these parties are a very real part of Canadian political culture and have been for a very long time. So, Canada is not really a country that comes up with new ideas as much as it imports and adapts ideas from the United States. I made a whole video about this, and unlike a lot of Canadians, I don't see it as some great moral failing. I think Canada and the United States are part of a single continental civilization with a broadly shared American culture. And it is just a fact of this setup that most American cultural production tends to occur south of the 49th parallel. But it is even more nuanced than that because, of course, American cultural innovation does not occur in equal proportion all across the United States. A few big cities play a disproportionate role in producing culture, 
And within those big cities, a disproportionate role is played by certain elite institutions like corporations, universities, and media outlets. Again, people often state these facts with a sort of conspiratorial tone, like it's something inherently sinister, but it's just one of the realities of how culture works in this American cultural civilization. Anyway, the point is that just as most Canadian trends in food and fashion and science and entertainment emerge from US innovation, so too have trends in Canadian political thought. After World War II, thinkers in the United States developed all sorts of new ways of looking at politics and public policy. This included refining the general theory of right and left that we use on this continent today, wherein the left is broadly associated with activist government and social change, while the right is broadly associated with freedom from government and social tradition. In Canada, as in the US, the right's gradual embrace of this sort of thinking was due in large part to the persuasive influence of people like William F. Buckley, Russell Kirk, Milton Friedman, and Ayn Rand, who were some of the most influential right-of-center intellectuals to come out of the United States in the post-war era. These guys offered philosophical and practical arguments that were informed by the trends in economic development and government policy that they had observed in the immediate post-war years. Their arguments were then made into an actionable governing agenda by trailblazing politicians like Barry Goldwater and Ronald Reagan, whose popularity inspired countless imitators. Though Canada would develop a conservative movement of its own, informed and inspired by the US one, Canadian intellectuals didn't really add any distinctly Canadian flourishes to this new US conservative philosophy, which basically mirrored the larger trend of Canadian intellectual culture in the late 20th century, which is to say Canadian philosophers and thinkers mostly just participated in the traditions emerging from the United States, which were in turn mostly the traditions emerging from the great cultural institutions of the great cities of the United States. Continental civilization. But anyway, what did this new post-war conservatism, this neo-conservatism, if you will, argue for? Well, theoretically, since at least the 1980s or so, we could say that the conservative agenda has prioritized tax cuts for individuals and businesses, both to stimulate economic growth and reduce government spending, lessening the burden of regulation on business and industry, greater reliance on the private sector for the delivery of social services, skepticism of environmentalism, hostility to the expansion of civil rights for the purposes of granting explicit protections to LGBT people, defending the property rights of gun owners, and interventionist foreign policy defined by open hostility to geopolitical enemies and increased support for the armed forces, an expansion of global trade, and an emphasis on the importance of Christianity as the moral foundation of the nation. Now, individual conservatives can, of course, dispute the comparative importance of these ideas to their personal ideology. But I think it's broadly accurate to say that over the last 40 years or so, people in both the United States and Canada have identified themselves as conservatives and allied themselves with the conservative parties primarily because they see some of their own personal priorities reflected in this bundle of values. The great insight of the late 20th century conservative intellectuals in the United States was that the most logical and powerful electoral coalition in a two-party system was one that brought together small and large businessmen, traditionalist Christians, and those with hawkish views on foreign policy questions. It took the Canadian conservatives a little bit longer to organize themselves around this agenda, and there was a notorious schism in the Canadian Conservative Party during the 1990s but by the time the modern Conservative Party of Canada was established in 2003, we could say its ideological foundations were a similar three-pronged stool. But that said, even if the core ideological convictions of the people who support Republicans and Conservatives are basically the same, there are some important differences between how the two parties function in practice. And here are what I would say are the three most important differences and the interlocking reasons for why those differences exist. Difference number one, the Conservative Party of Canada is more moderate. There are a number of issues on which the Republicans run much further to the right than the Canadian Conservatives do. The biggest one would probably be abortion, where the Republicans have grown more and more explicit in their promises to ban the practice, while the Conservatives have come to embrace an openly pro-choice position. The Conservatives are also seen as being generally more pro-immigration 
especially when contrasted to Trump. Now, some of this is just due to the different ways that these issues have played out in the two countries. Canada does not have a Mexican border crisis, and Canada's Supreme Court never declared abortion a constitutional right. And obviously, those were uniquely important variables when we talk about what has inflamed conservative opinion in the US. But I think the bigger explanation is just that the Conservative Party of Canada faces a more generally hostile electorate than the Republicans. This is, in my experience, something that Canadian conservative politicians will always complain about behind closed doors, how much they envy the seeming ease in which conservative politicians can get elected in the US. There's obviously a lot of cliched mythology about how much more conservative the US is, but there is some truth to it. A Republican running for president can take for granted the votes of the entire deep south for instance, but there is no comparatively large right-wing pool of votes to be found in Canada. Despite its reputation as a wilderness wonderland, Canada is actually a more urban country than the US, with elections very dependent on moderate suburban districts. And conventional wisdom says that voters in these places are very skeptical of anything that comes off as hard-edged or ideological, especially when it comes to social issues. This creates an obvious incentive for the conservatives to downplay or even shed beliefs that are seen as a turnoff to these sorts of voters. These same incentives exist for the Republicans, of course, and the outcomes of some recent elections in the US do suggest that the party has a problem winning over moderate suburbanites. But even when the Republicans lose overall, they are still always protected from a total wipeout, just given how solid their support is in the rural Christian South. If there was no South, you could imagine a very different Republican Party. In fact, when you look at how the Republican Party conducts itself in northern states, you do tend to find a party that operates quite similarly to the Canadian Conservatives. Now, politicians do not always do what is rational. If the Republicans have a tendency to run on platforms that are too extreme, you can just as easily argue that the Conservatives have a tendency to run on platforms that are too moderate. Which brings me to key difference number two. Canada's Conservatives are more hierarchical. I should note that this isn't exclusive to Canadian Conservatives. Politics in Canada is just a lot more hierarchical in general for reasons that have to do with the way that the Canadian political system is organized, as well as the generally fewer and weaker culture-making institutions that exist in Canada, as we talked about earlier. Canadian politics has basically always been structured around the idea of the strong leader. The Canadian prime ministership, in fact, is often said to be one of the strongest executive offices in any Western democracy, just given how much unilateral power he holds and how few checks on his decisions there are. Since the prime minister is elected by virtue of the fact that he controls the most seats in the parliament, what a prime minister wants the parliament to do is what the parliament does. This in turn reflects the fact that prime ministers also serve as heads of their political parties, with the office of party leader another extremely powerful position in the Canadian system. Once elected by the party membership, a party leader is granted basically unlimited power to decide what his party stands for and what its position on any given issue is going to be. The party boss also plays a large role in the selection and recruitment of candidates for parliament, who in turn owe the leader a lot of personal loyalty. Defying a party leader, by contrast, often results in the politician being expelled from the party. And what does this have to do with conservatism? Well, it goes a ways to explaining why the Conservative Party of Canada has been able to campaign in a more moderate way than the Republicans. There is no such thing as the office of the leader of the Republican Party, after all. There are only individual politicians self-identifying as Republicans, and they are nominated as Republicans by primary elections as voted in by ordinary American voters who also self-identify as Republicans. I would say that this system has made it a lot more difficult for Republicans in elite positions, you know, the congressional leaders and national party strategists and communications directors and that sort of thing, to get 
party politicians to run in the more cautious way that they probably think is wise. Individual Republican candidates running for Senate or House or whatever will run their campaigns on their own terms, pushing whatever policies they believe in with little interest in how their personal behavior might affect national impressions of the party. Likewise, since primary elections give a lot of power to the base of the party, the sort of people who might say, go to a Tucker Carlson event, Republican political candidates also tend to be more ideologically rigid, since that's what the base likes. The more top-down Canadian system, by contrast, gives the base less control and gives the party boss and his inner circle a lot of power to ensure everyone representing the party is singing from the same songbook, which for strategic reasons tends to favor a more cautious tone. Hey guys, so I just wanted to awkwardly butt in here with a quick anecdote because I think it is quite revealing. So earlier today I ran into this woman on the street who I know is a candidate for parliament and we got to talking and during the course of our conversation she revealed to me that she cannot even send out a tweet without first getting approval from someone in the party leader's office. So that is a pretty good illustration of the degree of uh, message control we're talking about here. The other important point I would make is just that political parties are a lot more dominant in Canadian political culture overall. In the US, there is a vast network of right-wing media outlets and influencers and activist groups who play a significant role in determining what it means to be a conservative and what conservative politicians should care about. In Canada, by contrast, these sorts of nonpartisan conservative institutions are much rarer and weaker, not just because Canada has fewer culture-making institutions overall, but also because the Conservative Party tends to vacuum up all of the talented right-of-center Canadians. Because Conservatives in Canada think of themselves as being less popular, you often encounter a sort of zero-sum strategic mindset in Canadian Conservative culture, wherein anyone who cares about Conservative politics is expected to just divert their talents to supporting the party because the party is the only thing that is going to stop the left. I can give you two examples from my own life. I used to work for a conservative TV channel up here known as Sun News, sometimes dubbed Fox News North. And from what I was told, the party never really liked this station all that much because it complicated their ability to define what Canadian conservatives stood for. When the station shut down in 2015, a lot of the people associated with it went to work for the party. Similarly, two of my friends who were rising stars in the world of Canadian conservative media, YouTuber Aaron Gunn and radio talk show host Jamil Giovanni have now been recruited as party candidates for the 2025 election. I just don't think that this sort of thing is nearly as common in the US. Like if Ben Shapiro was Canadian, he would have almost certainly been recruited to run for office by now. But in US conservative culture, I think that would be considered somewhat strange or even slightly distasteful. There's more of a sense in the US that the Republican Party and the conservative movement should be two equally important, discrete things. Whereas in Canada, the sense is that all conservative things should ultimately be subordinate to the party. Okay, and my last big difference between Canadian and American conservatives might be the most interesting one, and it involves questions of nationalism and patriotism. In the US, overt political appeals to patriotism and nationalism tend to be associated with Republicans. In Canada, they tend to be associated with Liberals. I made a whole award-winning video explaining why this is, but if I could refine my own theory a little bit, I would say that a lot of it just relates to the relative time in power the different parties have spent in each country. You can make a strong argument that the defining political figures of the late 20th century United States were Republicans Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan, while the defining political figure of of late 20th century Canada was Pierre Elliott Trudeau, a liberal. And in both countries, I think that the electoral success of these administrations created a sort of conventional wisdom about how the parties of these leaders 
were the natural governing parties of their respective nations, and that their agendas should be understood as reflecting the mainstream beliefs of most people living there. And then when you lay on the fact that anti-Americanism has always played a very large role in the Canadian sense of nationhood, you get a recipe for a very strong sense of left-wing patriotism in Canada. Contesting progressive public policy is seen as much more unpatriotic in Canada than it is in the US, which puts Canadian Conservatives in a uniquely defensive position without equivalent for the Republicans. An interesting alternative history question to ponder is how patriotism on both sides of the border might have wound up different if these periods of party rule had been reversed. During the 1960s, there was a famous anti-American writer in Canada named George Grant, and he hated the Liberal Party because he associated them with the Kennedy-Johnson administration in the US, which I guess seemed like the dominant political force in American politics at that time. But Grant's writings are very strange to read today just because he completely miscalculated the degree to which a backlash against that sort of liberalism would wind up defining American politics for the next generation, while Kennedy Johnson style liberalism would wind up becoming a central part of anti-Americanism in Canada. Conservatives in turn became the most pro-American faction in Canadian politics, with the success of Republican politicians, as I mentioned, fostering a great deal of envy among right-of-center people north of the border. There was only a brief break with this trend during the late 2000s when Obama was in the White House and the conservative Stephen Harper regime was in charge in Canada. I remember going to some conservative conferences in that era, and there was always a lot of patriotic crowing about how Obama was driving the US into the ground while Canada was this refuge of liberty. I remember this one conservative Canadian activist group even went to the big CPAC convention in the US and were handing out these little bumper stickers that were like, hey, come flee to Canada, we still have low taxes and freedom or whatever. So anyway, this is a big topic and I hope I explained it semi-decently. Basically, I think that a lot of the political differences between Canada and the US have less to do with the people themselves being different than the institutions we use to play politics being set up differently and thus incentivizing different types of behavior. In any case, these days, conservatives at all levels in both Canada and the US are in a pretty populist mood, with a lot of old assumptions being tossed. In sharing a stage with Tucker Carlson, Premier Smith demonstrated a willingness to openly blur the lines between her party, the tastes of its most ideological supporters, and the larger continental conservative movement in a way that up until now, Canadian politicians have traditionally avoided. So is she an extremist outlier or the wave of the future? Was her summit a brave, innovative move or a strategic disaster? Let me know in the comments and I will see you next week.